find it useful and enjoyable. And also, to I just want to say thank you also to uh, Scientix for uh, putting this whole thing together and allowing this to take place this evening. Um, basically, I'm really quite intrigued because I have given uh, web conferences such as this before, but never over such a broad area. And what I wanted you to do is now we now now we know how to uh, make a pointer with our names on it. On the next slide, could you actually point out where you're listening to this from this evening? So to get an idea of where you're coming from. I was interested to see how the spread was. So we've got people, gosh, somebody down in Spain. There's me in the southeast of England, already covered. Most, lots of people for Central Europe. I think I need a bigger map for this. Excellent, and there's Marina down, I think. Where is that? At the moment, maybe in the middle of the Mediterranean or off the coast of Israel. Uh, but anyway, excellent. So we have a broad spread over Europe, which is uh, very nice. And thanks for, uh, once again, thanks, long, thanks for coming along this evening. Basically, my little talk this evening is going to last about 40 minutes, although a good part of it, you are going to be doing some of the work. <laughs> Makes it easier for me. We're just going to go through a little bit to find out who's joining us this evening, what level of education you're involved in. Then I have a writing activity for you to uh, get uh, become part of or uh, take part in. And the writing activity is quite important because it's part of an experiment that I would like to carry out with you this evening. We're then going to have a small quiz. And then we're going to get to the body of this evening's session, and that is the question of whether expressive writing can help improve test scores. And I'll be explaining what expressive writing is as we go along. Finally, I want to raise the issue with you that, in fact, the technique I'm going to talk to you about this evening can be used in other situations outside of school. Indeed, you may find it useful to use it yourself from time to time. So basically, by the end of this session, I hope at least to give you a couple of things to think about. And if, if I've raised a new issue in your mind, then I've been successful this evening. Second, something to try yourself, which again, may or may not work for you. So that's the aim of this evening. It's going to be about an hour. I can stick around afterwards for questions, as we've already mentioned as well. So at this point, can I ask you to use your TIC uh, facility just to find out the, the level of uh, teaching you're teaching at the moment, where, uh, what groups you're teaching? So we've got some people in secondary, somebody also in Primary, primary, mostly secondary by the seams of things. Find the artists in, into, tw uh, into uh, 20 plus. Good. OK. So the vast majority of you are uh, working with secondary school uh, children, which is good, because I think this approach may work well with adults. Uh, primarily, I think it will work well with secondary school kids. I'm not too sure how it would work with primary schools, but OK, that's something you can try out. So that's good. So we've got mostly secondary school teachers here tonight. Good. Now, this is the activity that I'm asking you to carry out, OK? And uh, I appreciate that uh, uh, I can't really control what's going on here. And this is the important thing. Now. On the sheet of paper you've got, I'm going to ask you in three minutes to write either your thoughts concerning how you feel about sitting exams and why, or can you write about your last summer holiday? Now, across all of the audience we have tonight, it would be great if 50% of you wrote about your thoughts about exams and 50% wrote about last summer holiday. But of course, I can't control that. So please, could I just ask you, just choose which one you, you're going to write about. I'm not going to ask you what you write about or ask for details. Please just write either about your thoughts about sitting exams and why you have those thoughts, or just write about your last summer holiday. And I'll give you three minutes to do that. So 
good time for me to take a glass of water. Okay, about another 30 seconds, just to finish up, another 30 seconds. Okay, so that's three minutes and your time is up. Now, what I'm going to do <clears throat> is now we're going to have a quiz and this is part of the experiment we're going to carry out this evening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you 20 questions, okay? And <clears throat> we're going to run through these 20 questions quite quickly and uh, I will read the question twice and give you an opportunity to write the answer. However, I am not going to be going back. I'm not going to repeat it. I'm going to go through it quite a rapid speed. The question will come up on the screen and I will read it in my best English as well so you can understand. But as I said, 20 questions. Can you write the answers down? And once we get started, we're not going to we're not going to be starting, but we're not going to be stopping. These are based hopefully on science questions, as well as some questions about the European Community. Right, first question coming up: Cologne lies on which river? The city of Cologne lies on which river? Question two. Who is called the father of genetics? Who is called the father of genetics? Question three. Which European city is famous for its Alcazar? Which European city is famous for its Alcazar? Question four, which is the body's largest organ? Which is the body's largest organ? Question five, which is the EU's smallest state? Which is the, EU, which is the EU's smallest state? Question six, what is the name given to a type of chemical reaction that takes in energy? What is the name given to a type of chemical reaction that takes in energy? Question seven, which European country produces the most olives? Which European country produces the most olives? Question eight. Which, what was Winston Churchill's middle 
name. What was Winston Churchill's middle name? Question nine. In plants, what is the name given? What is the name of the pigment that captures light energy? In plants, what is the name of the pigment that captures light energy? Question 10. Which European country per head drinks the most beer? Which European country per head drinks the most beer? Six, uh, number 11. Which scientist first proposed the concept of plate tectonics? Which scientist first proposed the concept of plate tectonics? Tonics. Question 12. Which city was Italy's current Prime Minister Renzi the mayor of? Which city was Italy's Prime Minister Renzi the mayor of? Question 13. What is the name given to speed? traveled in a straight line. What is the name given to speed traveled in a straight line? Question 14. Don't give the game away, guys. <laughs> what, number 14, what is the capital of Turkey? What is the tap capital of Turkey. Question 15. What careers was Charles Darwin judged unsuitable for? What careers was Charles Darwin judged unsuitable for? Question 16. What two things is Fritz Haber famous for? What two things is Fritz Haber famous for? Question 17. In which year was the Channel Tunnel opened to rail traffic? In which year was the Channel Tunnel opened to rail traffic traffic question 18 what is known as the powerhouse of the cell what is known of the powerhouse as the powerhouse of the cell almost there what is ph a measure of what is ph a measure of 20. Pressburg, Pressburg was the previous name of which or this European capital. So Pressburg was the name that was the previous name of this European capital. Right. Sharp intake of breath. Thanks a lot for that, guys. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the answers. If you've been able, if, if you were unable to answer, don't worry about it. We're just scoring for those answers that are correct, okay? So if you've got the, correct, the answer right, that is a score. So let's go through the answers here. So Cologne lies on which river? It's the Rhine, Father Rhine, who is called the, so that's correct. Who, who is called the father of genetics? It's Gregor Mendel. Okay. Uh, which European city is famous for its Alcazar? Now the answer, the first answer I came up with Cordoba. However, I will accept, now guys, 
Uh, please don't mark on the screen. I'm interested in you marking on your sheet of paper if you've got the answer right, because we're going to be adding these up, okay? So uh, mark on your sheet of paper if you've got your answers right or wrong, uh, correct or not, because that's when we're going to be adding up. Uh, coming back to the point, the European city famous for its Alcazar. I picked out Cordoba, but I will accept Toledo, Segovia, or Seville. Question four, which, of the, which is the body's largest organ? The skin. Okay. Which is the EU's smallest state? Malta. The last uh, scientist meeting that I went to, Malta, marvelous place. What is the name given to the type of chemical reaction that, that takes in energy? It is endothermic. Which European country produces the most olives? It's Spain. I must admit, I first thought it might be Italy, but it's Spain. And Winston Churchill's name, middle name was Spencer. In fact, his other middle name was Leonard, but he was generally known as Winston Spencer Churchill. Okay. Plants, the name of the pigment capturing light energy is chlorophyll. And the European country that drinks the most uh, uh, beer per head is the Czech Republic. Why is that? It's because they've got good beer to drink. Also, too, uh, I was interested that, in fact, the second place that drinks the most beer is Austria. Okay. Which scientist first proposed the concept of plate tectonics? It was Alfred Wegener in 1915. And I think the poor guy, everybody laughed at him because nobody took him very seriously, poor guy. Which was the city where Italy's current Prime Minister Renzi was mayor? It was Florence. Number 13, the name given to speed traveled in a straight line was velocity. Capital of Turkey is Ankara. The two careers that Charles Darwin judged was unsuitable for is were banking and the church. In fact, his parents considered Darwin to be pretty useless. And in fact, uh, they thought of trying him in the bank and also as a priest in the church, but nobody would take him. And in the end, the only people who would take him was the Navy, because nobody wanted to join the Navy at those days. But that's another story for another day. Two things that Fritz Haber is famous for capturing atmospheric nitrogen, the harbor process, and a hundred years ago being involved in promoting the notion of developing poison gas for use in warfare. Which year was the Channel Tunnel open to rail traffic? 1994. The mitochondria or mitochondrion is known as the powerhouse of the cell. pH is a measure of acidity or alkalinity. And Pressburg was the previous name of Bratislava, a place that I was lucky enough to visit last year and enjoyed very much indeed. So those are the answers to the 20 questions, guys. On your sheet of paper now, can I please ask you to tot up how many of those you got correct. So out of 20, if you were unable to score, leave it blank, but can you add up, please, how many you got correct? Okay. Now, what I would like you to do is on this slide, you can see a table. And this is where I would like to try and collate how different people did. So if you scored, if you wrote about your fears, and as Herman's happily done, if you scored 14 or whatever, please mark it. Uh, if you wrote about holidays, can you also uh, 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 mark it? Did everybody just write? Ah, fine. The vast majority has seemed to have, okay, worked about, okay, good. Good. Interestingly, most of you, or at least people who were recording there, most of you wrote about your fears 
as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to your holidays. But okay, okay, fine, fine. That's interesting, actually. Um, now, of course, we cannot. This is not a scientific test or a, a very good scientific experiment. And those results there you could interpret as you wish. It seems to me that there's quite a big spread of results about the people who wrote about their fears. Um, the ones who wrote about their holidays may be a little bit closer together. I was interested to see the difference, whether it works, because in fact I've done this experiment now in two or three different environments, including a classroom environment, where in fact I think I got the system to work because what I was hoping that it would show, and I'm going to explain why we've, we've done this, is that what I was hoping it would show is that generally those people who wrote about their exam fears would actually do far better or better than those who wrote about their holidays in the test. And where do I come across that from? Well, it's this work which I'll be talking about. Writing about exam worries boosts exam performance in the classroom. This is a paper that appeared in the scientific journal Science uh, four years ago by uh, Ramirez and Bylock. Sean Bylock is the head of the lab, and I will be giving this reference again at the end of the at the end of the presentation this evening because it's freely available on the internet now, so you could uh, uh, read the paper yourself. Because they have found that in in school children, if you give children the opportunity to write about their exam fears in advance of an exam you can improve their test scores. Let's take a look at the, the results. Uh, well, let's take a look at the data on which they base that. So they believe that children's anxieties and worries about exams might undermine their performance in tests. They started working on a way to try and overcome this anxiety. And the idea they tested, and I understand this is based on cognitive psychology, of which I know nothing, the, the idea they tested is whether, given the opportunity to write about fears of exams and how people felt about exam, whether it could improve their scores. And indeed, their scientific experiment showed that this was indeed the case. This is summarized on this slide. Now, I appreciate that this is a very, very busy slide with two graphs on it. Just concentrate, please, at the beginning now on experiment number one, okay, on the left-hand side. What you have are exam results from pupils who were given two tests. First, they were given a so-called pre-test, and I should say the tests they were given were in mathematics, okay? So they were given a mathematical test, and before a so-called pre-test and a post-test. Just before the pre-test, they were said, they were put in an exam room, and they, they were told, do your best. Just do the test and do your best. So they carried out the test. After that test was carried out, they were split into two. One was a control group, which did, uh, uh, were actually asked to write about uh, anything they liked. And one control, the other group was carried, was asked to do expressive writing, writing about their exam fears and why. They were given about 20 minutes to do that writing. And then they were given a second test. Now, in this second test, they were put under a certain amount of pressure. They were told that the test was important for their future studies. They were even told that, in fact, if they did badly on the test, they may go to the, they may be taken towards, taken to the principal of the school to explain why they did badly. And even worse, they actually said, well, 
uh, we may be telling your parents about the outcomes of this test. So the children were actually put under a certain amount of stress. They then carried out the post-test. The post-test was then marked. And as you can see from the left-hand side, those of, those of the group that carried out the expressive writing, their scores went up. The group that didn't do the expressive writing, their scores actually dropped 12%. Okay, so there was a 5% gain uh, with expressive writing, and those without uh, the expressive writing actually suffered a 12% drop. At this point, I should say the, the, the testers here were very careful to, to, to make sure that the tests, the two tests, were essentially identical that the two, those two groups of students carried out, one with and without expressive writing. So that was showed then you could improve test scores by letting children carry out expressive writing. Now, the, the second experiment on the right-hand side of the screen is much the same again, except in this group of children, what they did was they, in fact, wrote, uh, 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 they actually gave different topics of writing to different people to to check. So was they were testing here, was writing about fear the main thing? Or would writing about anything actually help scores? And in fact, as you can see from the results here, that in fact, if you carried out expressive writing about your fears and anxieties of the uh, exam itself, it helped you improve your exam scores. But it was specific to that, because if you wrote about other things that made you feel happy or good, that had no effect whatsoever. So it was principally the, the, the idea of writing about anxieties and concerns could improve your exam scores. The question is, well, is this true? What happens? What is, what is actually happening here? So what they've done here is they were looking at uh, how uh, the anxiety might be controlled. So in this case, we have two graphs here, the control group on the left-hand side, the expressive writing group, the scores of these two groups. And they also carried out an experiment where they actually asked that they could judge in the children themselves the level of anxiety they were actually feeling at the time. So they, they were able to do a very quick check to check how anxious the children were. And they showed that in the control group that didn't do the expressive writing, the more anxious the pupils were, the lower the scores, as you'd expect. With the expressive writing, there was no real correlation whatsoever between scores and the level of anxiety the children had. So then somehow this expressive writing allowed the children to uncouple their general anxiety from their inability to score well in the maths test. How might this physically happen? What's the physical basis for this? Oh, I beg your pardon. This is, uh, before we go on to that slide, this is the last of the scientific data, the results. So they went back and they split the groups, the children, into two types of group. Those that are very anxious in general and those who are not very anxious about tests in general. And they followed them through 12 months starting in September through to June, through the school year. And what they did is they had exams in, in the autumn, in the winter, in the spring, and in June. And what they did is they allowed these children to carry out their expressive writing just before their final exams. Okay? And you can see here that throughout the year, their scores stay about the same, but then once you carry out intervention with expressive writing, those who've carried out the expressive writing 
improve their scores, boost their scores much further than those who did not. Now, if you do the same with children who are less anxious about exams, you have no effect of the intervention whatsoever. So this indicates that this specifically affects those children who are highly anxious about their exams and it helps them boost their scores. How might this take place? Well, they've done some brain scans uh, to look at anxiety in exams. And this is a picture of one of the brain scans that's one of, from one of their scientific papers. And they show that exam anxiety, so when you, when you experience anxiety uh, about exams, that lights up the same region of the brain as pain. You can see that in the upper figure there on the side, I think better, there's two, both lobes of the brain here have a very discrete area that's lit up. So basically, uh, when we experience exam anxiety, it's almost, well, it's recognized in the brain by the same areas that light up in response to pain. And their working theory behind how this is actually happening is this. We have a short-term working memory and a specific part of the brain is actually used in short term in that short term working memory. Now that short term working memory they call a scratch pad. It's basically where you almost mentally record short term notes. However, it is the gateway, a pathway to long term memory. So it's very important that your short term memory is the first step to assessing your long-term memory. And the theory they're working on is that in anxious students, the short-term memory is disrupted by negative thoughts, fears, and anxieties. And that interferes with the access to long-term memory, making a recall and memory much more difficult to access in exam situations. So the notion is that if you can open up the short-term working memory, relax the brain so this is less cluttered, if you like, that allows you to access long-term memory to answer uh, difficult questions in exams. Okay, and basically the details of all of this work you can access for your own, for your own interest on the internet. I've already mentioned the uh, science paper in which the work initially appeared. There is also a paper which is also very good, freely available on the internet from a magazine known as The American Educator. And if you would like to go and see Sean Bylock uh, talk about it, just type in Bylock on YouTube or visit her website at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, that's where I've got all the information for tonight's session from. Now, so I'll just leave that on the screen for the moment so you can make a scribble of that. But it's Bylock YouTube or at the University of Chicago website. You can get all of this information. Now, I just back up and say that obviously it didn't really work all that well in our little experiment this evening. However, I have tried this in a group of 36 year 11 science students. And although it was only done twice, I had the general feeling that it did certainly help improve scores amongst the anxious kids. I wouldn't want to stick my neck out about that because it wasn't done under real scientific uh, situations, but I did have a feeling that it might, it might actually work with these science kids that I teach. Okay, and you might like to try it with your children as well. And I have a personal experience which I'll share with you because I think you can also use this for yourself. Now, 
this is this last slide is just to give you a point that I think you can use this in all sorts of situations as a picture of a nice aeroplane. Well, believe it or not, I am in my spare time learning to fly. I'm training to, to get my pilot's license. And although that's not the plane I fly in, I fly in one that's very, very similar to that. Now, my personal experience of that is, is that last summer, I was out in a flying lesson with my instructor, and I put the plane by accident into a very extremely unstable situation. And in fact, I thought I was going to die. I was so scared that what had happened, I was scared out of my wits, and I thought we would never survive. Now, of course, my instructor is very good. He pulled the plane out of the problem, and we landed safely. But I left the aircraft quite nervous and quite a shaking wreck. And he said, well, look, you know, this is an experience. You're going to learn from this. Come back next time, and we'll go over this. And uh, so the following week, I went back, and we got back into the plane and started to fly again. And I realized that that experience of being scared utterly witless had literally cleared my mind of everything I'd learned previously because I was just so nervous of even being in the plane off the ground. And we had a flying lesson and we did some activities and it was okay, but I came back home and I really sat down and I thought, well, if I'm going to continue flying like this, or flying my, continue my flying lessons, I'm going to have to do something serious to get around this. And I kept a couple of days thinking, well, how are you going to do this? How are you going to get around your problem? And then suddenly I thought to myself, I know you've been talking to other people about this bylock experiment, writing your fears down. Why don't you actually do that yourself? So in fact, a very non-scientific uh, uh, a a non, very non-scientific approach, I came back to my office, sat here, I spent an hour and I filled four sheets of paper about why I'd suddenly became scared of flying. And it was simple, I didn't want to die. And I explained that to myself. I explained I didn't want to die a nasty death and I was writing about all the sorts of ways I might die in an aircraft. And I spent about an hour doing that. I then took the paper and I threw it away. The next week, I went back to the flying lesson. It was fine. No problem at all. Everything else had come back into my head. All of the routines I knew about how to fly the plane. And I'm happy to tell you that, in fact, this morning, I spent two hours in a flying lesson and had a fabulous time out over South England. Bright sunshine, 4,000 feet, doing uh, turns and spirals. It was fabulous. So if you are anxious about something yourself, try it. This may work for you. If it doesn't, nothing is lost. Okay, so at that point, I've come to the end of this session this evening. At this point, more than welcome to uh, uh, answer any questions. Uh, and also, well, thanks for being there and playing along with this this evening. Any questions, either on the chat room, I guess, or using your microphones? Let's see if any uh, questions have uh, been dropping in. Uh, just going start. back. Yeah, just going back over that myself. I've had the chat switched off while I was doing this. Let's have a look. So, uh, everyone, if you have uh, specific comments or questions, uh, please uh, take the chance to ask uh, Richard by uh, typing in your question. Or if you want, uh, you can always uh, switch on your microphone and ask a question. So you have a question uh, from Helen. Ah, that's that's a really good question, Helen. And honestly, I don't know. In the examples that I am familiar with, they did it in the exam room. Okay, so they actually did it as the kids were sat there. Uh, 
and um, how the and you could also push that is you know will will the effect last over a long period? I'm not sure. Um, if you take me as a personal, if you uh, if you uh, if you take me me from a personal experience, it certainly lasted. From my experience, it's helped me over quite a long period of time, six months at least. Okay, but uh, that's a good point, and it's yeah difficult for external external exams. I wonder if you are doing external exams where the kids do it the night before. That might be something. Just uh, I, I would just read out the question uh, in case somebody missed it. So okay, sorry. Was if anyone uh, yeah. had studied the effect of time on the results. So, for example, if there's any optimum time before the exam to do the, the writing. So, uh, that was the question Richard was uh, yeah. answering. Yeah, okay. And, and another question, or another thing I said, or I, 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 I neglected to say uh, during it, is that I understand uh, this technique was worked on with um, uh, mathematics exams, but I understand it's also been tried in other subjects. And it can also help there as well. Anybody else has a question that they would like to ask uh, either by typing or by uh, just uh, using their microphone? Please feel free to do so. We have another good, let's say, 10 minutes. Okay, so there's a question here on the board about how old were the participants in the study? Will this work with secondary school children? Yes, this was this was secondary school um, uh, kids, uh, Janice. And I think um, it would work uh, quite well. Uh, I, I tried it with secondary school kids, and I think it would work quite well with them. I think also, too, it's highly likely to work with adults. I have spoken about this technique to a couple of other people who uh, are um, a couple of people who are um, uh, mentors of uh, uh, children and adults, and have heard that this seems to be uh, links in with the same sort of thing about getting adults in general just to talk about anxieties and how that can help. And um, so that I think it may be a general thing. It would be interesting to see um, if, uh, if it went with primary school kids. But secondary school kids I think would be fine. Um, and Helen is saying, I worry that most anxious students might work themselves up into more of a panic uh, by writing, uh, by being asked to write about it in advance, Helen. Uh, one wonders, although what I've liked very much about that result I showed over the school year, you could see quite a good effect with those children who were highly anxious whereas those who were not so anxious had, little, had a limited effect with. The, actually, also to us, Helen, okay, uh, thanks for that, Helen, about saying your, your trial practice. I must admit, I would be very interested to find out if uh, anybody, any of you this evening are interested in going away and doing it, what the sorts of results you might find. Uh, is there anywhere to do feedback? Uh, no, but if you email me, uh, it would be good uh, to try and find out, you know, pushing this further, because I think it might be good to try it. I see a raised hand. Uh, do we have a uh, Shaheen, is that the raised hand? Uh, do you wish to uh, to ask a question? No. No. no? Okay. Uh, okay. No, All right. Thank you. So I guess you don't have. Uh, there are no more questions to to ask. So everything must have been very very clear. 
Um, yeah, uh, j just just putting in there, I see Frederica's interested to give it a try as well. If, if, if you do, Frederica, please let me know how it goes. I'd be very interested to see how it works. I just 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 thinking about it. There's ground here for a Horizon 2020 project, <laughs> testing children like this. I like it. Um, okay, so hang on. So we've got. Can we show the the paper link again? Yeah, hold on. Let's go back to. Can we go backwards? Whoops. There we go. So, uh, if you simp you don't need all of the details with the paper from Miller. I tested it this afternoon, and if you go onto the Science Magazine website, which is freely available by Google, from Google, so Science, Science Magazine, and in the search, just type by lock, it will get you through to a manuscript instantly. Okay, so that's um, uh, the easiest way to do it, and it is now freely available as it's now over four years old. So you don't have to subscribe to Science to be able to get hold of the original paper. I'd also, serious, uh, also to, as I mentioned previously, I found the paper up there uh, from the American, uh, American Educator, a very useful paper to read as well. Okay, so Tony is saying do use something similar, but not before the exams, after the exams. Yeah, reflections post exam. I, I, I wonder, Tony, if that would give you an idea of whether it's a long-term effect. So coming back to that initial initial question about um, uh, how long would the how long do you need to do this in advance? I wonder how, um, do you have a feeling whether that works over a long period, Tony? And I see Janice is making the point about biology, teaching biology to 13 year olds. Do try it and if, uh, I'd be interested to know what the uh, outcome is. Okay, Tony, so the goal is to reflect on performance when we had connected enough reflections. Okay. You could be horrible, Tony, and get the children uh, to sit another exam ex uh, directly afterwards just to see if they're scoring better or not. That would be mean, wouldn't it? See, there's a, quite a lot of interest in uh, actually trying this out in the classroom. Which is great, which is great. And it would definitely be great if, uh, if uh, you would get some feedback on how this has worked for other, for other teachers. There's a subject of another webinar there. Exactly. <laughs> like uh, one year after or six months. No, I, 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 like I say, I think I, it, it, this is something that is, is relatively easy to set up, but you have to be, the, the difficult part of it is judging the different children and what the effect might be. And that might complicate things a little bit. But I think if you have a very good idea of the performance of your children in general, so you have an idea of the performance uh, a good idea of their performance, how it will be before the intervention takes place, and then see what it is like after the intervention, then you're in business, I think. Um, do you have any, okay, from Janice, do, do you have any more papers regarding reducing stress and boosting the students' marks in exams? Uh, not, no more than the ones that I've presented this evening, okay, Janice? So uh, those are the only ones I have. 
I wonder if you look on the internet and do a search about reducing exam stress, there might be other things out there. Okay, and Tony is saying that it's not a scientific approach, just the way uh, to how children reflect on how they progress over time and put all of this in their e-portfolios. Fine, fine. Although I wonder whether you know, it may help children overcome anxiety such as this. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, round this uh, webinar up. And uh, first of all, thank uh, Richard for a very interesting and uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, session. I think it was very like uh, it was very uh, interesting, and you managed to uh, illustrate your point quite well. And uh, we are going to uh, to be hosting more uh, webinars, and the next uh, webinar will be on the 26th of March, and uh, that is going to be on the subject of. Um, uh, applying multiple intelligence uh, approach in teaching STEM at young ages. And uh, Cornelia Melku will be uh, leading the webinar, so you uh, will be receiving this information uh, soon. And uh, also I'd like to add that uh, the, the recording of this webinar will be made available under the Scientix uh, webinar uh, page repos yeah, repository, as Victor here points out. Uh, so you're going to be able to uh, go back to the to the webinar and uh, disseminate it to your networks. Uh, if you've enjoyed the, the webinar, please feel free to share. Anything else you would like to add, uh, Richard? No, just to say thanks for coming along this evening. I've enjoyed myself. And as I said, if, if, um, if you've had um, if I've stimulated some thought, that's great. That's the main thing. Thought-provoking is what I'm here for. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck with flying. OK, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Have a, an excellent evening, and uh, see you uh, online for the next webinar. OK. So, goodbye. Yay! From the south of England, goodbye.